Right there, yeah. See? Look, come here. <laughs> there you are. Look at that. Sweetie. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm in Tulsa. Right. We're to, we need to get a club going in Tulsa. No, I. Right, right. I gave up Florida. I'm up here where the fish people are now. Well, we have a warehouse. We're just doing online sales right now and trying to do as much of this as we can. We might do a store. I don't know. I don't want to get locked into it. You have 20? Do them for 20, yeah. The shop, uh, club discount. Club discount. What's this? The the uh, the supplement. Okay. Yeah. I guess. Are you? We got to get another tank now. Right. We need to get the disease. Yeah. I have a couple of tanks with no filter. I have a couple of tanks with no heater. I got a lot of they are. Endlers, I don't have heaters in their tanks. Right. White clouds, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. oh, no, I understand. I have other plants there. I look in the tank, but... 
That's the problem. I'm going to give up the phone. It's much too complicated. Well, by all means. Okay, I must to say, but a fun trip. You go back to a lot of plants. Right. right, I know. That's, yeah. You can do, you can do, uh, four more. you can do four, and you can do seven more than one. You do three or four, so they'll just work on one and read the other
Okay, we ready to get started? Hey, new meeting. Come on, we're having to come to the meeting. <laughs> The top one is C six seven C eight D five F. I don't know. Um, it would be. It's probably going to be Fulton. What are you doing? It's 
probably fully members. We're live. <laughs> what are you doing? I was going to switch you onto the church's Wi Fi because that's going to be more stable than mine. And you might, it might be faster. <laughs> Uh, it could be. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it could be one of these, even. I don't know. Oh, Try this one here. This is it. All right, everybody, get ready. We're going to get started. Nervous. Everybody ready? We're going to get started. Everybody ready? We're going to get started. I got you. Okay, we got a lot of stuff tonight, so um, we have to talk about a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to say uh, the auction went pretty good. I want to thank everybody that helped out. I can't even remember who everybody was. There's just so many people. Um, the board, Amanda running stuff back and forth. Um, I know Rick Bell helped out. Aaron helped. Um, Brandon stepped up. And, and I know I couldn't do this for everybody, but Brandon wanted to bid on a book, but the price went up a little high. So um, Thank you, Mitchie. I personally went online and bought him a couple books. So uh, Thank you. Okay. No, he's the future of this club. He is the future. He stepped up and, and put all the numbers in to bring the things up on the board. So he did a, a great job just asking. And yeah, he was helping out every which way. So um, like I said, it went pretty good. So we are now incorporated at the 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we switched our bank accounts over. We had to hold off a little bit. That's what kind of held up the checks for the auction because we were in the process. So um, we're going to have to figure out some fundraisers to pay some extra prices now because we have to pay for an accountant. We have to get um, additional insurance. So there's some fees that are going to be involved with it. So we're going to have to bring in some members, find out some ways to get more members in here, like having great speakers like Father Fish. And uh, hopefully we can uh, get some more people to come in and, and do something. So um, one of the things we like to do in April is any nominations for board members. Our board has room for 12 members. Apparently we have nine. So we have room for a couple more members on the board. Um, the meetings are via Zoom, so you don't really have to go anywhere to get to that meeting, except it's on your couch in front of your computer. So uh, think about it. If you want to nominate yourself or have someone nominate you, and uh, we'll have the elections next month if we get six more people that want to run. I would love so. to, but it's Wednesday night. I already have a new one. Yeah, I know it's tough. Well, are, are we married to Wednesday night? So, so can we switch it to a Tuesday or a Thursday? Or? Yeah, so I'm thinking if we can accommodate you. <laughs> All right, so we can have a little discussion. Maybe we can work out something. Jeannie, any days that you can make it besides Wednesday? Just not Monday and Tuesday. Just not Monday and Tuesday. So Thursdays, maybe. But you don't need that. Aaron be more important. <laughs> I don't know about that. I do. Aaron, we'll take somebody. I'll miss it. So we could switch it to a Thursday night. But I don't know. You're more important than I am. No, cut it out. We need you, Jeannie. No, you don't. No, Jeannie, you're the pit bull of the club. My job, I don't need to be in a meeting. Okay, so one thing we did not do, I, I didn't have a chance to do because I was running tonight. One thing I did not do was the wheel of names for the raffle. So we'll do that a little bit later, maybe right after the um, presentation. We'll put all the member names in so we can do that. But we can do one other thing. Anybody have an April birthday? March birthday, too. Oh, March, too. So since we had the auction last month, we didn't celebrate the March birthdays. So anybody with a March or April birthday, come on up here. 
I changed mine. No, you didn't. I know you changed it from March to April. So it's also my birthday this month. The big six zero this year. Yeah. I was left out of ten packs. And then, and then, two more years. I'm. You were. I was the only birthday left out. Okay, so everybody know the drill. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. All right, so we each get five raffle tickets. Let's see that song again. All right, thank you. Anything else that I forgot? We talked about nominations. We talked about the, oh, the jewel picnic and, and sw slash swap. So the June meeting, instead of being the first Friday, it's going to be the first Saturday, which is June 1st. And we're going to have the swap. Hopefully, we'll get a lot of vendors coming in and um, picnic. So if you want to, you can bring a side dish. We're Not for required. Side we'll have the meats and the um, drinks. So uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, probably um, barbecue chicken. And um, anything else you want to bring? Yeah, so if somebody wants to bring something, potato salad or chips or desserts, anything like that, we appreciate it. Olivia likes meatballs. I have a book up here with a pen if you want to okay, sign, sign start today. Sign it up. That'd be great. As long as you put it down. in a different container, nobody knows. <laughs> so, okay. With, um, I think it was $20 for a table. We'll put information out in the next FinFax and online. So um, with any further ado, I want to introduce Father Fish on his natural method of keeping aquariums. Let's see. I need to... It's like being in a house full of family. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting inviting us. I, uh, Ron and Brenda, where'd Brenda go? She she's, out. she's out with Bella. Bella is the mascot or puppy, so she'll be back. Brenda is what makes the um, what makes a lot of this possible, truly, because. She's the workhorse of the family. She's my niece and is responsible for building the plant business that has made it possible for us to do all the stuff we've been doing, including being able to make these kinds of trips. I started YouTube about five years ago, and I did it because I was running a shop the shop was more or less failing. Uh, it was not in a good community. It was a little retirement community in Southwest Florida that had typically a uh, fish keepers amount to about 1% of, of the population. I think where I was, it was about one tenth of 1%. So it didn't have many people coming in the door. Uh, and most of them were snowbirds. And it's pretty hard to keep a tank when you're not there six months of the year. So, but I did it not to run a business and have a shop. I did it because I had a whole series of ideas and bucket list items <laughs> that I really wanted to, to do something about. So I had, I was, uh, I was, I had decided at a given point around 2000, that I was going to become a copywriter. I've done a lot of writing in my life. It was a natural fit for me. It's something I wanted to do. And then got, I got a call from a friend who had a pet shop in town, and they wanted to get rid of the fish department. It was a, a three-bay shop, and the fish were in one bay. So... I figured, you know, my aunt, who is Brenda's grandmother, always told me that she saw me in a pet shop. So I figured, you know, I could do this for a year. 
and get it out of my system. Well, nearly 20 years later, I finally got it out of my system. After, after developing something that I've been trying to do since the 60s, a friend of mine who I knew from the time I was a teenager, his name was Merle Cohen. Well, some of you may know about Merle. Merle and his brother Dave started the hobby in the 50s in the Baltimore area. They, they, uh, they had the first shop, and out of their shop, 40 other shops were born. They were shipping things up by train from Florida and supplying all of these shops. But more than that, Merle became a, a, a real stalwart in the industry. He had, he, when he left his little shop, he built a wholesale operation. It was about 40,000 square feet, most of which was fish. It was a vast complex of tanks and tubs and vats and salt and fresh water, every fiction imaginable. This was in the 60s. He also did dry goods. He invented quick cure. He was the first person to use a plastic bag to, to, to ship a fish. Prior to that, they were in um, carryout containers, like Chinese carryout containers. I remember buying fish that way when I was a child. He was somebody I was close to for years. And he, one of the things he enjoyed doing was traveling around the world uh, to the conferences, the, the, the major conferences. He went to, to one in Indonesia and wound up in Malaysia and met a man who was doing open, uh, open um, reef systems for hotels. They were on an island or very close to shore. So he was able to bring water in, literally pump it in and out of this system. He had no filtration. They were outdoors. There was no light. It was Hawaii. The Hawaii Aquarium is like that. They have huge outdoor aquariums that are open systems. The, the substrate is a foot and a half of sand. The same with this fellow. So Merle brought back in the late 60s to the saltwater industry in the U.S. The concept and the, uh, the, the background, the experience of a deep substrate for saltwater. It made perfect sense in a saltwater environment because it created a way to be able to raise the microfauna that coral need in order for them to be able to thrive. And that was, that was the direction the industry was trying to go in, trying and failing and failing and failing because they couldn't get the chemistry right. It wasn't just the salt water. It was the biology. It was the biological system. And they had to, they had to do that in order to be able to make the coral thrive. With Merle's um, system, an organization started, I think, in Idaho, Idaho or Iowa, I get them mixed up, called GARF, Geothermal Aquatic Research Facility. They were on a geothermal vent, so they had water boiling up from the earth. They maintained salt vats, outdoor vats, and grew coral like there was no tomorrow, all in deep, six-inch deep substrates. They collected bacteria literally from all over the world. They found the best bacteria beds were in the mangrove swamps in, Aust in northern Australia. But they literally collected bacteria from all over the world and built these systems with that 
created a product they called Miracle Mud. The name is still out there. There are some products carrying that name. It's not their product, but it probably is a derivative because it was all over. Through They started in the 80s, through the 90s. Um, it was a couple who were doing it. He died in the in the first decade of this century. She tried to keep it going. Mary, Mary Ann, Mary Jo tried to keep it going and finally closed down the shop. There is still a website called Garf. It has more research on it, more articles, more information than probably any other source of information about saltwater systems. They developed synthetic rocks. They developed culture rocks. They did everything as Merle had done with freshwater, they did with saltwater. And it really created a foundation for the for what now is a, a flourishing saltwater coral industry, all based on a very simple concept that in order to be able to do that, you have to create a natural environment. You create a natural environment with a substrate. Transitioning that to fresh water was what I decided I wanted to do. This was right at the point where Wallstead had just published her first edition. I think she's up to seven editions now. It's been a very popular book. Dense, as dense as a book can be to read. If you've been in it, you know what I'm talking about. It's a scientific treatise based on laboratory work, but it is, it is absolutely foundational. I have had a group of people working with me on our Discord channel with, that we call The Shoal for the last almost two years now, putting together a book. We're getting close. We're at about 250 pages. It is called The Natural Aquarium. Or, or I think that's what it's going to be called. That's the concept. It's based on the experience that I had and the hundreds and now thousands of other people have had doing deep substrates, dirted tanks, growing plants in freshwater environments, and keeping fish in significant numbers in those tanks. And that's really what it's all about. I, when I started, I realized that, that Wallstead had two problems. Number one, she couldn't keep the nutrients out of the water column. She was using gravel as a cap to hold the soil down, but it was, it was porous enough that water basically flowed through it and washed nutrients into the water column. The other problem was that, that her system depleted, the nutrients and the substrate depleted after about a year. Couldn't keep it going beyond a year. The plants would literally fail. So I, I, I worked to, to overcome those two problems. The first one was easy. Uh, that was simply a matter of putting sand rather than gravel on top because sand slows down water flow. And if it's steep enough, it'll slow it down to the movement of the cilia on the microfauna moving the water. That's how slow it is. I've had people for years... Um, the Bill Barr crowd have been deeply and strongly opposed to this because they believe there's no effective movement. They say it's too slow. Well, it is slow. But what I realized after 15 years or more of doing this is it takes about five years for that system to actually become fully cycled, for it to fully develop to the point where the nutrients that are here run through all of the series of animals and plants that, and bacteria that they're going to go through and return as 
the original material, the original uh, material, the original mineral. It takes about five years for that cycle to complete. In the meantime, you have to have an, an, a nutrient base strong enough and viable enough to be able to perpetuate itself for that five-year period or a time in that frame. Um, so the Jap what's the Japanese fellow's name who, who did? Amano. Pardon? Amano. Amano, yes, thank you. Amano started marketing for his deep substrate. He developed deep substrate. He started marketing supplements. If you ever watched any of the Green Machine videos, well worth watching. He hasn't been active for years, but the videos are still up. The channel still exists on YouTube. And he creates magnificent, huge, deep substrate systems. He starts by opening these little Amano packets of various chemicals and pouring them on the glass and then puts various kinds of, of soils, or he's, he really began using some of the early commercial products. But the principle was he was adding minerals and biologicals to the substrate. So that's what I began doing. I wound up after about seven or eight years developing this. This has been refined now for nearly 20 years. It contains about 15 different elements. They're not listed on here, but they are listed uh, at, at our website. They're listed also on the Discord channel. They're things, simple, obvious things like blood meal, bone meal, um, uh, uh, baking soda, lime. What else? Biochar. <laughs> Biochar. Uh, we have worm castings in this, I think, worm castings. So there are organics in it as well as chemicals. This gets mixed in with the soil. The soil is two parts peat moss or some other similar organic like choir, one part potting soil or an earth substitute, a soil type substitute. It can be from your backyard. And one part um, compost material. That can be pond mud. It's anything that's that's rich in organics that are breaking down or broken down. Two to one to one to one fourth. Two, one, one, one fourth of this. That's the ratio. You stage that up to get to the to get to the correct volume. We have one of our uh, um, one of our technicians on the Discord has come up with a formula, uh, a mathematical formula for determining how much you need for different size tanks, which is wonderful. We 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 had so many requests for the dirt that we began packaging a fifty gallon bag of dirt, which includes everything, and a 20-gallon bag of dirt, which includes everything. One is half the other. So the two of the 20s equal the 50. And it does just about one inch of soil in a 55-gallon tank. I did a bag and a half yesterday in a 75, and it was perfect. Capped it, we put it in dry, capped it with two inches of sand, put a plastic bag in, filled the tank, put a, without disturbing the sand, put a sponge filter in, and I will, I was hoping to get some fish tonight. We'll see. Uh, I've got fish coming uh, Monday. Uh, I'll have fish and plants in there, usually day one. I, I put it together quickly yesterday, and we left too early today to do much with it. Um, but set the tank up, put plants in it immediately, put fish in it, a few, not a lot. A lot of plants, a few fish to start. By a lot of plants, I use 
basically the Dutch formula. The Dutch formula says 75% of the space in the tank needs to be plants. I don't recommend 75%. I do recommend 50%. That's a lot of plants. These bags, I've got... Oh, 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 oh. I'm glad you caught me. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> Let me get one of these. Ah. I think I have enough. I do. I've got 30 of these bags. I'm going to get every one. So make sure you get one. I've got 30 of them. So it's enough for everybody to get one. These are stem plants. There are 16 different species of stem plants in these bags. They're uh, We got them on Tuesday. They're in really nice shape. A few are just beginning to brown. We cannot ship them beyond beyond Thursday uh, because after after five days, these were cut Monday. We got them Tuesday. We ship out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We don't ship them Friday. This is what's left over from uh, from the week. We ordered a thousand, uh, which gave us a hundred bags. We only sold seventy. Did we just go dead? Oh, the battery. Is there a power cord? Somebody yes. we can plug that in. Mom, I got that property. We got it, I think. Um, anyway, make sure you got one of these and take it home. It's, some of the plants may not make it. Most of them probably will. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit talking and see if you have any questions. Mm. <laughs> yes. Uh, how do the fish react to being in, in the dirt? <laughs> the way a fish normally, well, here's the thing. There's, there's one more step that you may have heard about it if you watch my videos. The, the step is, I call it the food web. The, and, and what that is, is literally bringing natural fauna in from the wild and, and installing it in your tank. We do that by setting up what we call res a resurrection jar. It's simply some leaf mold from a pond or a creek that's put in a jar and sits there sits there for uh, a month or so, long enough for you to be confident, confident there's nothing in there that's going to hurt your fish. There really isn't much anyway that can. Uh, but then when you put that in, along with some leaves, the leaves become the food for the system. They're feeding the microfauna, which feeds the macrofauna, which feeds the small fish. There's not a lot you can do for big fish. You can do it. It takes a much bigger tank, a much richer fauna bed, and fewer fish. But it, it can be done. Uh, it means breeding a lot of small fish and shrimp and cobapods and whatnot. But it gets out in the wild. They are in That's exactly right. So their behavior is is a natural and normal behavior. It's the kind of thing we often don't see in in more traditional aquariums, where we'll see the fish hit the front of the glass the minute we walk in the room looking for food. You don't see that so much because they're they're grazing all the time. And they're finding food naturally. So you're not feeding as often. You're not creating that kind of uh, you know, that kind of pattern. Uh, and it, it just, it creates, there are a couple of things it does. So far as the fish are concerned, it creates a more natural environment for them. So far as you, the fish keeper, are concerned, it creates uh, a situation that's far more interesting and far less effort, M substantially less effort.
You're not, here's the thing. The traditional system is essentially a toilet bowl system where you're dumping nutrients in there to the point of fouling it, hauling the water out to keep it from fouling, and, and doing that on as frequent a basis as you can manage. It's you're literally pouring in poop and flushing it. You're treating it the way you treat a toilet. And that's not an appropriate place for fish to live. It just isn't. Dumping chemicals in to try to prevent it from fouling. That whole thing goes out the window. Uh, no chemicals, very little filtration. I use sponge filters, mainly because it provides a little bit of water movement that I think is really important. Um, it provides some biological filtration. It doesn't create a current that 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 does this to the water. Now, I, I do a much larger filter in very large tanks. Anything 150 gallons or more, I like to use canister filters simply because it, you really need to move that water. You don't need to move it harshly. It doesn't need to whirl around but you need to move it enough so you're, so you're not creating dead spots. Uh, ponds are not the very best environment for fish, even though that's where a lot of fish live. The very best environments are, if it is a pond, a spring-fed pond where there's some water flowing through it. Uh, streams, creeks, rivers are, are, are the the most effective ways to do that. Now, we duplicate that in the fish tank. I duplicate it in small tanks with sponge filters. And all it's really doing is moving the water. With a lot of plants, they take up all the nutrients, take up all the nitrates, the ammonia. You never have ammonia in those tanks because the plants absorb ammonia directly. They take ammonia right out of the water before the bacteria even can get to it. Yes. So when you're doing your resurrection jar for the food web, there's no pond mud in that? I found there it somewhat problematic. You you get a lot of a lot of microorganisms with the mud, but it can foul very easily. The people who have had trouble have been people who have brought like a handful of mud, which was the first thing I described in the very first video. I did grab a handful of mud and throw it in a jar. Turns out that's not the most effective way to do it. The most effective way is to get a handful of, of leaves of rotting vegetation, but a small handful, not a big handful. You don't need a lot. And you put it in there, and then you can feed that with dry leaves, with leaves that have fallen from the tree. You never want to use anything green because it'll foul the water. It contains sugars and other organics that overwhelm the system. So, yeah, um, the, the tank, the, the jar can become, it can die out for lack of nutrient. So you need to be adding nutrients to it. Ultimately, you need to put it in, in, in a larger a larger container like a tank and then be feeding it with leaves. It, leaves are the primary food source for virtually every freshwater system on Earth. They're, the research that's been done has demonstrated that it's the leaves of trees that are the foundation for the food chain. Everywhere, everywhere where there's fresh water and trees growing, it's the leaves of the trees that are providing the fundamental nutrient exchange, the, the new nutrients coming into the, into the aquatic system. They're feeding the microorganisms that are feeding the plants that are providing all of the, 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 the nutritional foundation. Yes. Fish that are better suited for this, and, and are there any that don't do well in the system? 
we we were chatting earlier. What's your name? I'm sorry. Andrew. Andrew. Andrew and I were talking earlier. Andrew does big fish. He doesn't do substrate. Uh, he does plants potted. Um, and I guess you do anubias. So you're doing you're doing mounted mounted stuff as well. Um, I really want to uh, find. I need to be in touch with you because I want to find some ways for you to try a, a, a deep substrate system. One of the big problems is the earth movers. But I've discovered that most of them are moving dirt because they're trying to get, they're moving the substrate because they're trying to get the hardscape in order to, to lay eggs. So if you put a flat rock in the tank, they will use that before they dig. They may still do some digging, in order to create a pit for the babies, there are pit spawners, um, and which which means if you do another inch to two inches of of sand, four inches rather than two, you generally can overcome that problem. The exception are the Central Americans, and they're pretty much hopeless. The Central American cichlids, they're big. They're, they are earth movers. Um, I, I did, I, I had some jaguars that I was able to pit spawn in a 500 gallon tank with a 14 inch substrate. And it was successful. There was no dirt in the bottom, but that tank was up for almost 10 years. And after four or five years, there was two inches of dirt in the bottom of that tank that they never dug down to. I had rocks in their other hardscape, as well as plants. I grew Sagittarius, Valisneria, and Swords in that tank, deep enough root system that they could hold on when being tugged. The other secret is to have enough plants because the big cichlids will go after one plant and they'll tear that one down until it's gone. They're leaving everything else alone. I've seen that happen over and over. So you have a sacrificial plant, basically. And that works pretty well. Any other questions? So the, the sand is like a, it's like a check, check ground. Yeah, it, it sort of, it does exist in nature. It exists in, in, in creeks and streams. Not so much in rivers because the water is moving more slowly in rivers, but there are rivers that have sand beds. It exists in lakes and, of course, on shorelines where the sand is really protecting a, a richer, protecting and sustaining a richer deep substrate. Um, one of the things I recommend if you're setting up a saltwater tank is to go out in the water, get out into the ocean, uh, out to your waist, and with a big bucket and dig sand, take a shovel and dig it out and dig as deep as you can and get that sand. It'll be live sand. It'll be full of bacteria. You can put it in your tank and it will immediately establish a, a, a live culture in the tank. It works instantly, works brilliantly. It's totally effective. And the play sand works good. Then. Play sand, the trick with play sand, because it play sand is basically unwashed sand. <clears throat> it's simply bagged up as it's mined. Um, so it has a lot of dust in it. Probably some organics, depending on where it's been harvested, where it's been mined. The problem is you can't pour it into a tank. Because it'll turn it, it'll turn it into mud. Mm -hmm. But you can put it on top of the soil, dry, cap it with a bag or a bowl, so that when you put the water in, you're not stirring it up, and that becomes more effective than than like pool sand, <clears throat> which I used for years. I I at one point I ordered sand from a company that sold um, gravel, sand, all that sort of stuff. I ordered a half a ton, 
and 50, 50 pound bags. It was like powder. It was so fine. Freaked me out. I used it anyway, and I found that it was a more effective culture than even the coarser sand. So the finer the sand, the better. The thing about sand is it doesn't compress. It's broken, jagged pieces of rock. That's what it is that are like this. So they, 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 when they come together, they create spaces. And the water flows through those spaces. More importantly, bacteria are able to grow on the surfaces of those grains of sand in those spaces. <clears throat> so it creates the finer the sand, the more bacteria. That much sand as opposed to that much gravel, this has a thousand times more surface space than gravel does. If you actually measure the surface of a grain of gravel and the surface of a consummate size, grains of sand, the sand will contain vastly more surface space. That means more bacteria can grow on it. Yes. Can you use a silica sand? The silica, I think, is the best sand there is. Okay, because so it's. Sand blasting supplier, you can go and get number two, number three silica sand. You know, also, the slags. Uh, uh, yeah. Tractor so supply uses black, slag. The That's slag. The, black, the black slag. I've used a lot of that. Okay. It's totally inert. Anything that's inert. You don't want anything that's going to dissolve like crushed shell. Um, yeah, it, I got a bag from them. Um, I've been getting it for years. Got a bag, went up to Super Cichlids to install a tank. Put the dirt down, opened the bag of sand from Tractor Supply, dumped it in. It was talcum powder. I mean, it was that grade literally the size of talcum powder. Freaked me out. It was in there by then. I didn't want to dig it out. I had him. I had the guy who was working with me find a bag of sand on the back shelf. He brought it up. We capped it with, with a coarser sand. That tank's been set up now for about a year and a half. It's growing plants like weeds. It's just amazing. I was sure that sand was going to be too fine. It's not at all. And that's been my experience with the fine sand. It the, the finer the sand, the better it does. Super sick was down in Dover. Yes, right. Yeah, I've got a father fish tank set up there. I'm trying to convince them to do a big one. Yes. So Andrew. What's the difference between your approach and what that's approach? It sounds very similar. It is very similar. Two things. Number one, the supplement. <clears throat> I add nutrients to the soil. I also have a formula for the soil. She uses basically garden soil. Not enriched, nothing, nothing else in it. <clears throat> she caps it with gravel. Now, her latest addition, um, she said, I guess you can use sand if you really want to. Or words to that effect. So she begrudgingly acknowledged that sand is not a horrible thing to put in your tank. Uh, but she has not understood anything about what we're doing. She and Bill Barr are very close, and they do the plant, what's it called, their, their website, the plant center or something. Um, they, they are heavily into CO2 and FERTs. I don't use CO2. I don't use fertilizers. That's basically the route she's gone in order to be able to sustain her tank long term because the, the substrate alone, well, it provides a media, but it doesn't provide the nutrients. Uh, they, they deplete. This system doesn't deplete. It lasts long enough to be able to recycle. Now, you're adding nutrients to it on a continuing basis with whatever food you're putting in uh, plus the leaves that, that are going in if you're putting leaves in to feed the food web. So that's a, that. those are nutrients going into the system. 
The other issue is water changes. I do water changes. I don't do water changes monthly. I don't really do water changes every three months. I found that at about six months, I usually need to do a water change. And the fish tell me because it's a closed system. It's a pond basically. And and the the, the biological activity builds up in it. Um, I just did a water change. I have a 23 year old tank. It's been set up and running for 23 years with basically no change in the substrate. It's had a lot of different fish in it, a lot of different plants. Uh, I put, it's, it's uh, the 55 cut off. So like a 12 inch 55 as opposed to 18 inches. So it's about 30 gallons, four foot by 12 by 12. Nice tank, I really like the tank. Um, I put 400 watts of LED floodlights on it, four boxes. You know, they come in these like 10 to 12 inch, 100 watt uh, fixtures that are made for outdoor floodlights. I put four of them, laid them right on top, one right alongside the other, completely filled it. Had them on there for probably six months. I got a lot of growth, a lot of plant growth, but it reached the point where it, the plant growth kind of stabilized and algae began to develop and it began to get, began to get a, 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 a more, it began to get algae in the water, began to get green water, really yellow water. Um, that took about six months to get there. So I dropped the water level down just this past week, halfway, drained it out, shot, shot it back up, took one of the lights off. So I'm now at 300 watts. Uh, the fish are back to perfectly normal, being happy, swimming around. I have a lot of natives in there, Florida natives, uh, as well as things like, like cardinal tetras and um, some some uh, tanganyikas. I've got a pistos, just a mix of probably 75 fish in, in that tank. Anything else? Are, we done? That's a lot of Are you blown out? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Make sure you got a plant. I've also, I also had. Make sure you take uh, take one of each of these with you. Got some stickers. They're free. Uh, we've got soil here. Uh, special club price. These are normally twenty five plus ten for shipping. Unless you have them for twenty bucks, this will do a hundred gallons. So nutrient for a hundred gallons. And there's some t-shirts. And Brenda has some wonderful uh, creams and salves that can be used, that can be put in your hands that won't come off in the water. They won't create an old slick in the water. They, they're absorbed by your skin and, and they, don't, um, they don't create a, water, a problem in the water. Well, thank you all very much. Great Thank you. Uh, as I said on my newsletter last month, I said I haven't tried your method yet, but I plan on doing it soon. We have, we've had a hundred people watching this, so, okay. oh, wow. so we got another hunter. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it live for a while. Okay. And we're in uh, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, right now, southeast corner of the state, near the uh, intersection of Route 95 and 476. So if you know the area where we are, that's where our club meets. First Fridays of every month, except for March when we have our big March auction. It's the first Saturday and our June picnic, which is the first Saturday also. And we don't have meetings in July and August. Great club. So, great club. All right, great. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a little bit of break and then we will have the... Um,
raffle for the members and the uh, raffle that you buy your tickets. So uh, buy your tickets real quick. I'll check to see who's here and mark everybody down for the raffle. All right. Thank you, guys. We're going to uh, sign off. Appreciate having you all. Been a lot of fun. Sorry I didn't get into um, into the chat at all. Uh, but I'll go back and check it out later, probably tomorrow or maybe later this evening. Love you all. Bye for now. <laughs>